Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Can you hear me clearly at the back? Yes. We're not too much echo, I hope. Okay. Gardens are ephemeral. They're created, they're changed across time, and very often they disappear altogether. When we moved into our current house in 1997, there was no garden. The owner's priority was to have as much pasture as possible for their two horses. So there was this right up to the house walls. But it was a blank canvas for us, that was the excitement. We wanted to create a garden. And the first thing that we did was to ask the local agricultural college in us to come up with their JCBs, turn it all over and create some flat areas for us to then develop. We had it all put down to good grass, and so the story begins. <laughs> By 2004, little plants, box plants that I've put in to create a knot garden, they joined together. There's my mother acknowledging the fact that now they've joined together. We've got a pergola, we've got the beginnings of an arbor, with some climbers just starting to go up. By 2006, the new hedges that we put in, um, were sufficient that we could curve the end one so that we could see the garden beyond and we bought this cute fountain to put in close to the house. And then I spotted these two boys, these bronzes, in a, an auction. They were separate lots but to my mind they would be good if put together to create a feature in the top level of the garden where we've got some specimen trees. They live there and they're coming with us. When we move, 2014, tiny ewes that I put in either side of the driveway are grown enough that I could turn them into these cones. And as I've just indicated, 2019, we are going to be moving. And whoever follows us will have their own likes and dislikes, their own priorities. Fashions change across time. Do you remember crazy paving, if you're old enough like me? That was really fashionable in the 1950s, as were rockeries and dwarf conifers. Not too long ago, prairie planting was in vogue. That seems to have gone off the boil a bit now, and formality is coming back. And whoever succeeds us will have their own personal challenges, as were primarily financial. If we were going to create a 1.6 acre formal garden, it was going to be really costly. So we did it all ourselves. That's why it's taken so long over the years. But that's been a joy. The garden's organic. We've seen it change across time as we've had money available and the energy to do it. Another factor is that energy. You know, family circumstances can change dramatically. And in extreme circumstances, social unrest, um, I just missed it, thankfully, when I was born, but before I was born, everyone was digging for victory during wartime. Front gardens, back gardens were turned over to increase the amount of fruit and vegetable available. And then increasingly now, a factor that whoever followed us will take into account probably more than we've had to is climate. Penstemons that I used to lose every year now survive. I've never seen them doing so well. If anybody wanted to know what did the Bensons create as a garden between 1997 and 2020, when hopefully we will have moved on, where would they look? Well, yes, we've taken photographs, they're in the family. As time goes on, I'm sure if it's not my son, someone who follows him will say, oh, we can get rid of these now. We've opened the garden for the National Garden Scheme, the Yellow Box Scheme. They will have old booklets in their archives where the garden is described and some photographs and certainly reappeared on their websites of old, but will those still be accessible to anybody researching our garden history? Local newspapers, yes, we've often appeared in those when we've opened the garden for charitable events. Those are certainly in an archive in Monmouth. And my artist uh, cousin is painting a painting of the garden as a memento for us to take away with us. Uh, somebody might come across that in the future. It might be sold on by the family. Who knows? And then as an agricultural college, the department that came up with their JCBs in 1997 to turn the garden over, well, that's closed. 
don't know what's happened to the accounts. So anybody that knows that they were involved back then, I think it's unlikely they'd be able to find any evidence of the college's involvement. Yes, somebody could come up with a machine um, like I've got. I do geophysics as a garden historian. If you know a time team, they have a machine that goes over the surface, they run it over the surface of ground, and it shows up rather like an x-ray of the remains of walls and foundations that lie below. Somebody could commission that. It's very costly. But I don't think anybody will be interested in our garden because we're not national figures. The house isn't historically significant. It will probably just disappear in time. Generally speaking, the further you go back in time, the harder it is to find evidence of a garden's existence its existence, let alone what it was like. And for that reason, generally, garden historians focus on the houses and gardens of nationally significant people in time, and houses that have got really striking architectural features. For that reason, garden history has focused in the past, particularly on the houses of kings and queens, top courtiers, otherwise top diplomats, um, people have played a, a big part in our nation's history. Before I turn my attention to Cambridge Colleges, I have spent some years researching the houses and gardens of the Dukes of Beaufort. Their surname is Somerset. The current Duke is called Harry Somerset. They were only made Dukes in 1682. Before that, they were known as Earls or Marquesses of Worcester. There are three main houses associated with this family. Badminton, which is the main family seat now and has been since the 1660s. You're probably associated with the horse trials that are held there annually. That's the Dukes of Beaufort main family seat in Gloucestershire. Troy House, however, is in Wales. And this family actually hailed from Wales. Can trace their roots back to being Welsh. Uh, through the Herbert family, and then through marriage to the Somerset family. And Troy House, which I've researched in depth, was occupied by them in 1600, up until the end of the 17th century. And then finally they auctioned it off in 1901. But way before that, Random Castle, also in Monmouthshire, in South East Wales, was their first family seat from 1492. And just so that you can work out the geography here, this is South East Wales and the Seven Estuary with Bristol here. Babington is here, right on the border with England, the Y forming the border. There's Troy, and Random slightly further into Wales is positioned there. Here's Rackham Castle. It was a royalist stronghold in the Civil War, and um, when it was under siege, it was badly damaged. But as you can see, substantial amounts of it still exist. It has lost its roofs. It's lost its gardens, unfortunately. But there are still remains of the basic structure of those gardens. Certainly in the 17th century, it was more a palace than a fortress. And it had Renaissance-inspired gardens, which were really at the forefront of garden design in the UK, which I'll show you now. There is a plan that exists. Um, often when the parliamentarians took an estate, they then surveyed it to see what it was worth, and they drew plans of it. This is the plan from that time, dated 1652 by Lawrence Smythe. The castle is positioned here, with a garden in one of its courts. Then it's got these huge terraces. There are three terraces, two of them are much larger than the third. And they've got bits that stick out on the terrace as well, like viewing platforms. But all of them overlook this great pool, shown in blue, which initially ended here. This funny structure at the top I'll be describing shortly. That was added later. The Great Pool was formed in the valley base by blocking, by damming, the stream that runs along here. The dam being at this bottom end here. These terraces. 
Uh, three or four years ago, um, they were excavated. A bit of um, testing, um, test trenches were put in, just to see if there was anything still surviving in the way of pathways, foundations, walls. I didn't find anything, except probably robbed out. Local villages of Raglan, very short distance away, uh, are known to have robbed Raglan after the Civil War for its stone. So probably anything of value would have been taken away. But uh, some more archaeologists are going to be conducted later this year. We'll see if that turns up something more useful. But on the edge of these terraces, along here, something did turn up during this excavation period. It's an edging stone, and in its uh, colour, composition, it's probably Tudor. Although this part is broken, can you see that it's beveled? This is where it would have been buried in the soil, the, the substrate of Tibby. We've got evidence of the pool existing from this account written in 1674. Then, that's the round of villages nearby at the end of the siege in 1646 during the Civil War, were said to cut the stamps, they are banks or dams, of the great fish pond where they had stored a very great carts and other large fish. So it wasn't just there, just for aesthetic purposes, very nice to look over a stretch of water, it was full of fish for food. We've got an even earlier piece of evidence for the existence of the Great Pool. It's an account of an inquest held by a coroner on the body of a child found drowned in the water called a fishy pool, so it was full of fish back in 1465, beside the Lord's Manor of Raglan. From the dates, it's most likely that the pool was created by Sir William Herbert, first Earl of Pembroke, who was a key figure in the history of Wales. It always helps to know the family history, the, the family that own a property. Um, so it always helps to establish a garden's history by knowing the ownership history of the house too. And then we've got this account that survived from 1587. Thomas Churchyard liked travelling around sites and then writing up little accounts of what he'd seen. <laughs> this is what he said about Raglan in 1587. Not far from thence, that's Raglan village, the famous castle fine at Raglan Height stands moated almost round. That's because although the keep has got a moat all the way round it, the rest of the castle has only got a moat on one side because the other side falls away steeply where those terraces are. Made of freestone, upright, as straight as line, whose workmanship and beauty doth abound. The curious knots, ah, we've got a knot garden there, or several knot gardens. Wrought all with edged tool, the stately tower that looks all pond and pool, so we've got pond as well as pool. Now we've got a fountain, a fountain trim, that run both day and night, the field in show, a rare and noble sight. Sounds wonderful. They had a fountain there. Any other evidence of a fountain? Well, there are two courts at Blackland Castle. One that you enter is surrounded by service buildings and the Great Hall. If you go through the Great Hall, you then end up in this court, which has always been called the Fountain Court. It's lined by apartments that would have been for guests. These are This is the prestigious area of Blackland Castle, and this is the location of the State Department where Charles I stayed several times. And this is believed to be the base of the fountain where the fountain stood. During Victorian times, the remains of this fountain still existed, but Victorian tourists being what they were, they liked mementos. And they demolished this, this, this is a sign. Uh, sadly, there are no photographs um, that have come to light as yet of what it looked like. There should be some somewhere from the late 19th century. Another piece of evidence of the fountain's existence. This was written also in 1674. A pleasant marble fountain in the midst thereof called the White Horse 
continually running with clear water. It's another reference to it always running with water. And now we know it was marble. Why was it called White Horse? Well, from the accounts, we know a fountain existed in 1587, at least from that time. And again, looking at the family history, most likely it comes from the time of William Somerset, third Earl of Worcester. But there's been some confusion on who created this fountain. Because this is William's son, Edward Somerset, fourth Earl of Worcester, who is, was a top courtier in Elizabeth and James I's courts. He was the first member of the Somerset family to be made master of the horse in 1601. That was a very prestigious position to hold within a royal court. And if you look closely, around Edward's neck, he's got a medallion. And on that medallion, there's a little white horse with a man astride it, which has led people to say, oh, this pleasant marble fountain called the White Horse was created by him when he was made master of the horse. It sounds so plausible, but remember, there was a fountain there running night and day in 1587. Perhaps there was a fountain, and then when um, Edward achieves master of the horse status, he changed it to a white horse, marble horse. <clears throat> no, still looking for evidence as to who did what. But we don't know how it got its water source. I was part of the team that did this um, dig by the plinth where the fountain was thought to have been positioned. And yes, we found a stone-lined trench, channel here. We've got down to the stone at the bottom, we're still excavating here. We found all sorts of artifacts as we did this. But this stone-lined channel for taking water to the plinth here can be traced back to where the main well is in the pitch court and to the springs that lie on high ground outside of the castle walls. Going back to the plan of 1570, sorry, of 1652, we talk about the terraces in the Great Court. What is this structure up here? Well, it's a water parterre. Water parterre is rather like a knot garden, except instead of a pattern being traced out by evergreen plants, there are water channels. So you've got a collection of grassy, flat-topped islands with water channels between. We've got a much simpler one here. The water around those connects to the great pool. This one was created by Edward, the master of the horseman. That's what my research shows. And although the great pool was dammed, the stream that's dammed that ran through it to create the great pool, what Edward did was to then go back along the stream to create another channel so that water could flow in both sides of the water park there to ensure it was always filled with some water during times of drought. I'm going to enlarge that. This is one of the most complicated water park airs created in the whole of the UK. And it's survived in the sense that the water has long since been drained away. It's just a trickle of a stream now. But there are still humps and bumps in the ground showing the outline of these islands. And if you look carefully, you can get onto the Great Pool at four points. It joins up the Great Pool. And there's a little building here which appears to be sat in the water of at least three compartments. This isn't a plan of that water part here, but it's one that was commissioned by Robert Cecil for his house at Hatfield. This is in the National Archives. We've got no evidence that it was ever built unlike the one at Radham, but it shows some similarity, and that's not surprising. Robert Cecil and Edward Somerset, Master of the House and Horseman, were great friends, or uh, rather collaborators. They had houses next to each other on the strand, and I think this is a case of you can build a complicated water parterre, as you've seen mine. Note that there is a building in the water channel. So these are the islands, triangular islands, and we've got a building with arches. That's because it is actually set in water. Remember that 
small amount. Anyway, this is what Thomas said happened next. The Marquis of Worcester, supposing the king had touched upon his greediness of purchasing all the land which was near to him, showed his majesty the rows of trees and told the king that beyond those trees stood a pretty tenement called <laughs> Naboth's Vineyard. And because he would not have Naboth's Vineyard to be an eyesore, a temptation to him, he had planted those trees to hoodwink his eyes from such temptations. So we've got evidence here in the early 1640s of the then owner, occupier of Raglan, doing some landscaping using trees to alter vistas. <laughs> we are years ahead of Capability Brown and his style of doing just that, to alter vistas. Going back to the plan, it shows a bridge across the pool. And there's a little building. This is a map overlay that I like doing because it puts uh, the features that you know existed years ago in the modern landscape. So it's that plan that you've seen already put on top of, electronically, a modern OS map so that we know where the great pool stretched out towards the A40, shown in white here, on the OS map, right in the village is down here. The great pool and its dam stretched out to lie on what now is a modern farm. So I know exactly where this uh, bridge was positioned in the modern landscape. So I walked there, did a survey of the area, and then found this picture I held at Uppington, which shows the castle after the Civil War, where the pool doesn't exist anymore, it's drained out. But there's a little building here, which I'll enlarge. Remember the arches in the bottom of Cecil's um, building on his water plateau? That implies it was sitting in water. Perhaps it was sitting in water on the Great Pool by the build, by that bridge. Certainly the surveying and map analysis indicates that. And finally, from this plan, there's a huge approach route here. This was put in by the Marquis before the Civil War took off. It was never completed because of that war. And it was the fashion at the time to create approach routes to add even more impressiveness, if there is such a word, to, for the guests seeing where they were aiming for. Raglan Castle from this direction sits on the hill and it's silhouetted by the sky. Not only that, he also added this small pool. How did he do that? Because now there's no evidence of any pool. Was that also a breach? Is this in fact a dam? Well, there is a painting, again, at Buckminton. When it shows this approach route after the end of the Civil War, late 17th century, and if you look carefully, there's a sluice there. They're controlling the flow of water here, the level of water. And then if you look at a plan, a modern day plan, of where there are water courses. Just here is the right area for the lake that's been, or was created. Here are the water issues. It then goes underground. If we look at the map overlay and we impose on it where the water issues are, yes, this is what the Marquis took to dam and create that lake. There's evidence of the dam itself, the stanks. And I know that the red gate, the new gateway, is actually positioned under a 1960s house on the edge of Raglan village. All done to make an even more impressive approach, altering the landscape again, years before Capability Brown comes on the scene. So what we've got here is my reconstruction of Raglan Castle, as it would have been at the time, just before the Civil War. And I'm showing you this because it's better than for showing the scale of everything. So it's not taken from stills. This is a special software package where you can put dimensions in, 
Select the type of stone that you want. So it's bringing the research together in a way that enables you to better understand the scale of everything. The Great Wall was a third of a mile long. It rivaled that of Kenwood, but it's half a mile length. The water parterre at the head of this great pool were inserted by Edward Marshall, of course. It's huge. That's the building that was shown in the water near the castle. There is an existing building that's at Swartzen that isn't set in water, but I've taken its top section. It was a viewing tower to view um, deer hunting. And it's the right period, beginning of the 17th century, so I've modelled it on that. And this water parterre had channels wide enough that you could go along them in a boat. There's something shown on the plan in the centre of the water parterre. Most likely, it was a fountain. There's no detail of it, so I've kept it as a very simple fountain. And then as we go back, we're looking at the terraces. Archaeology, as I've said, hasn't told us what's on the terraces but most likely there would have been fan trees against the walls, retaining walls. These are shown on the plan, therefore tying up boats. There are man-made islands. They would have played war games here, Neue Machia, mock battles, to be observed from the terraces or from this bridge. There's the building that I put in the water because there's evidence of those arches. So everything is to scale. You can see how enormous that water parterre was. And as we move away, you get a better impression of the size of the Great Pool. And we're going to stop even before we get to the bridge. At the end of the Civil War, in common with most aristocrats, the family went into exile, either to Ireland, Rome, in France. But one member stayed, Sir Charles Somerset, the son of Edward, Master of the Horse, and he lived at Troy House Estate, just one mile south of Monmouth. Shown here in an aerial view, where the house is here, the estate farm is very, very close, and then there's a walled garden on the west side, four acres, Thought to be 17th century, but no. I found evidence that the walls are actually from the 16th century, as are the bee bowls that are inserted. And what Charles did was to insert in the pre-existing walls a little ornamental entrance here so he could conveniently take his guests from the house through this archway into the wall garden because it was the fashion in the early part of the 17th century to observe nature. And this little um, entrance is ornate. If we look at the, pedis, the pediment, Charles married a local heiress, Elizabeth Powell, and the initials Charles and Elizabeth Somerset shown there. The cornucopia stands for horns of plenty. So all the guests would have read this knowing that within the wall garden there's plenty growth. Um, struck work here, typical of the Jacobean period. Inside the wall garden, that's what the entrance looks like. It's actually a little building. There's one of the 16th century bee bowls. And all of this shrieks to the visitors. The owner knows about architectural fashions because it's straight out of an architectural treatise done by Sebastian Salio. And this is the book that was translated for the first time in 1611 into English. And if you look at that, and you look here, you see how similar? There's nothing else like this in all of the UK. At least I haven't discovered anything like it. Um, and it's the beginnings of having ornamental entrances to garden areas using architectural fashions of the day. I'm going to take you now um, slightly away from the house into the wider landscape. On the modern OS map, the house is here. You can tell by the contour lines that this land goes up quite steeply to a wooded ridge 
full of springs. There's a little ruined building which is about 300 metres away from the house on rising ground and there it is. Ruined because of an ivy that's taken over its top part. But it's ash of stone, it's got a little gothic doorway, it's got a string course here. People have said, oh, this is a game larder. No, it's not. Game larder is always closer to the house. Other people have said, it's a garden building that the owner would take guests to, to take refreshments and to sit and observe the landscape around. No, it's not. This is what it looked like, apparently, before the ivy took it over. Um, this comes from the memories of a person who worked on the estate until the 1970s. It has no windows that you can look through. It's a tiny window in the gable end, and there's one at the other end that still exists. When I visited this building, I scraped away the earth, because that's all it's got in its floor, and discovered this lead pipe coming in through the doorway. Oops, sorry. It's got a broken end. And on the opposite wall, there's a lead pipe going out, and I traced it with a metal detector going down the hillside in the direction of the house. What this is shrieking is that this is a conduit house. There was a lead tank between the broken ends, and water from the springs up on the ridge would have flowed down through lead pipes along here into that tank, then through a series of taps, down here again under the force of gravity, to supply the house with water. Probably by the time it reaches the house, it's coming at some force, it would have been sufficient to work fountains. You need a force of water unless you're going to install pumps. And because the string course on this building is so similar to that on the garden entrance, chances are it was also put in by Charles Sunset, he who stayed at Troy during the Civil War, rather than going into exile. He dies in 1665, and he leaves Troy to his great-nephew, Henry Sunset. And Henry, when he returns from exile from Rome, lives at Troy for a short time, but then he inherits Badminton. And it's from that time in the 1660s that Badminton becomes the main family seat. But he gives Troy to his only surviving son and heir, another Charles. And Charles marries in 1682 and uses Troy House as a centre for his ministry on behalf of his father, all the family's extensive Welsh estates. This is Troy House. At least it's the part that the first Duke funded the building of for his son. The older Troy house, which Charles Somerset of the um, garden entrance, <clears throat> lies behind. This section is joined onto that. It faces north, so I call it the North Range. And there are accounts held in Badminton archives that show that it was built between 1681 to 84, that it cost this amount of money, two and a half grand nearly, and that the gardens were also enhanced at this time. So it was some way in present, funded by Dad, who by this time was the first Duke of Beaufort, um, made so by Charles II for the family having helped Charles I so much. And also discovered amongst the letters in Badminton that Robert Warren, previously unknown, had a hand in designing this and the Duke's house at Chelsea and altering the gardens there. And you often find this as you research one property, names come up that give you leads into discovering the history of another property. This is a plan from 1712, so just 30 years later, that shows the river trophy here, the house here, and on this side, a formal garden, which we call an exedra garden, because it's got this demi moon, it's got this semicircle at the end. From it, this is what the author uses to represent an avenue of trees. Avenue of trees towards the trophy and then picking up again beyond. It's empty of trees, it's formal garden. 
formal garden here and here, but elsewhere around orchard. The next plan is from 1765, so some 50-odd years later. If you get your eye in, there's the River Trophy, here's the house, here's the Exedra Garden, but now it's full of fruit trees, like the rest of the orchards around. And why is that? Well, in 1698, the son and heir of the first duke was killed in a coaching accident. And because Badminton was the main family seat, it was decided that Troy wouldn't be occupied by family members anymore. A steward was put in to administer the estates. Formal gardens are exceptionally expensive to maintain, so clearly it was decided some decades after that tragic accident, they put the formal garden down to orchard so it would be more productive and less costly. Makes sense to me. That's my theory, anyway. So Troy isn't really occupied substantially by members of the Somerset family other than for hunting and fishing on the nearby River Wye. And eventually it's auctioned in 1901 along with lots of other properties in Monmouthshire. And eventually they sell it, it's sold to an order of French nuns escaping religious persecution in France. And Within living memory, it's known that they ran the house as a school for girls and a modern laundry. And in the 1960s, on the east side of the house, where that ancient Exedra garden had existed, they did some hard landscaping. They created an Exedra garden with rockeries and curvy parts. And I wanted to know, is this actually right on the footprint of that ancient Exedra garden. So what do you think I did? A map over there? So here's the River Trophy. And I've used that as a location mark along with the house walls to overlay the 1712 plan of this area with a modern OS map. There's the house and the farmhouse behind it. Here's the nun's exedra. I hope you can see that from the back. I'm tracing it out of the mark. And now here's the ancient exedra garden. It stretches much further out towards the trophy. Comes back, there's the exedra, the demi-moon. Then when it returns, it's returning behind what we now call the farmhouse. And this is what that ancient exedra would have looked like. You can see that today because we've got a book that contains this etching. This is Stansted, drawn and then turned into an etching at the end of the 17th century. Here's the Exedra Garden. It's even got shoulders on it with a little building there, like one at Troy. Fountain, but predominantly still very formal. And then, just as Gilmore showed for Troy in 1712, there's an avenue of trees stretching out into the wider landscape. So again, here's a reconstruction. So from the research that I've done, this is what it would have been like, walking through the formal garden before that tragic accident and the house ceased to be occupied regularly by members of the family. So walking away from the house, formality, but on a much bigger scale than during the Tudor period. I wonder if the fountain was worked by the conduit house system to get the force, the pressure needed. And then at the midpoint of the demi loom, we've got an avenue of trees as shown by Gilmore, stretching out towards the river trophy and then picking up the distance beyond. And as we swing round to the back of the house, the east elevation of the house, some of these walls still exist. I know that because of the map overlay and getting the scales adjusted. And what was fashionable at the time, before that tragic accident, late 17th century, hedging material turned into little buildings, some of them garden buildings. This difference in level still exists this day. And before the nuns, 
built a chapel in this position, within living memory it's known that there was a garden entrance there. And then what I haven't got time to tell you about is the map regression. Comparing maps across time and surveying this area, I know that there was a water parterre here. But not a complicated one, like 17th, early 17th century. By the end of the 17th century, they tended to be just stretches of water. This gives you, hopefully, an idea of the scale of the garden. All these walls still exist. That's where the orchards were, the plan. And then as we come to land down here, that's what the front of the house looked like. It was stuccoed originally. And this portcullis is the emblem of the Dukes of Beaufort, which, because it was in danger of guillotining people, was changed to a statue of the Virgin Mary, which still exists. The house has not been occupied for at least three decades now. Badminton, then, is the main family seat. And I have little to say about it because um, there's so much written about it and research on it. And we have got some evidence for you to look at at the end of this talk. Large body of evidence, however, even at Badminton House, where family letters, key pieces of information are kept in their archives, there's very little that predates the 17th century. You might well ask why so much was damaged and lost during the Civil War. But there are loads of etchings and paintings of Badminton and its estate, its gardens and its design landscape. There are garden plans and plant lists, accounts and diaries, letters written by various people after they visited, and more recently, loads of photographs. This is a lovely um, picture of Badminton. And on this side, if you look very carefully, you can see that there are bombs here. So this was the location of a bowling green, most likely at the beginning of the 18th century, certainly late 17th century. And this one, which we can date accurately to 1699, though the green was here. This is so typical for fashions of the day, late 17th century, twinned fountains by the side of the front elevation of the house. And there, because we've got deer here, deer were allowed to come and be close to the house, as indeed they are today. And this is a plan that you'll be able to see in the volume that contains it, Britannia Illustrata, of the formal gardens around the house. The house is just here. Imagine the expense of maintaining that. But then, Henry, first Duke of Beaufort, when this was created by him and his wife, the first Duchess Mary, he was the second richest man in England, the first being king. And this is a plan of the gardens at the time that is kept at Badminton. And I've outlined part of it in blue so I can enlarge it to show you the writing. We've got the garden and kitchen garden there. We've got grass, a pond, and then beneath here it says current garden. So these are all semi rows of white, black, and red currants. The church is here. Dwarf trees is written here. And up here we've got a melon garden. That's just part of the plan. Also in Britannia, uh, Britannia Illustrata, we've got um, another etching of Badminton, where the house is here. They're the formal gardens. And then it shows all of that surrounded by these avenues of trees that would have been used for riding along, but also symbolically have meaning in that Badminton has influence throughout the nation. It's a cosmologically inspired garden, this design landscape. Similarly, anyone, anything of substance, always finds its way to Badminton. It's the centre of what's happening in the late 17th century. Of course, I can't resist using a bit of technology. I think it looks much, much better when it's coloured, because then you can cover up the areas of woodland. You can see the writing better. So we've got a deer park here. They're red deer, 
We've got a fallow deer park here, another red deer park here, a warren down here, and I think the right shot up there. I've yet to do a video reconstruction. <laughs> well, I hope from what I've said that you've got perhaps a better idea of how garden historians research gardens histories.